Unconditional Positive Regard and Non-Judgment with Dr. Ivana Draskovic. Hi, Ivana. Thank you for joining me. And I would like to invite you to talk a little bit with the viewers from this ebook about the idea of unconditional positive regard and non-judgment from your perspective and your um, development over time. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for inviting me. I was actually quite excited about, um, about talking about that a little bit. Well, I, and I think um, when, I, when I think of unconditional positive regard, of course, who comes to mind? Carl Rogers. I think that will be the person that comes to mind for all of the people when we talk about necessary but not sufficient um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, uh, uh, aspects or factors in, in therapy. And that's the word that always has stuck with me, that they're necessary, but they're not sufficient because we often think of them as being boxed up in a certain way. And we define uh, unconditional positive regard in a certain way, empathy, in very definitive kind of ways. And for me, the idea of language, and this, this developed, I think, when I was doing my... Um, preparation for PhD candidacy exams, when I have to actually figure out what's my theoretical approach and what does it mean to, to, to work with a refugee from unconditional positive regard or potentially from a, a, with a person who's quite different from you. And um, I think the language for me plays the biggest role. Michael Foucault said language has a power to empower or disempower. Mm -hmm. And so how we use it really affects the other person and us. So when I mark papers, for example, I often give feedback about, um, you know, when you think about um, a more mindful language or, or be mindful of your language and what language you're using here, because we tend to still be stuck in that language where we call person schizophrenic, or we call person ethnic, or we call person um, mal-depressive, like that really old school language that speaks to the character of the person, not the struggle that they're struggling with. And for me, in my experience, my life experiences of being a refugee and later on being um, a newcomer to Canada and you know, um, being a person with invisible disability, I would react to certain labels as, wait a minute, I'm so much more than that. So when I think of unconditional positive regard, uh, for me, that is being able to sit with another person, first from a human perspective and recognizing that that's a human being that you are sharing the space and conversation with and opening up space for their experiences to be told and for their stories to be shared. Because if we close our view within the definition or within the Western definition of unconditional positive regard, we don't consider what that is for the person that's coming to see us. We didn't open up the case, we just kind of dictated how healing takes place from our perspective. And with that comes um, the idea of this non-judgmental attitude. And often students and colleagues and my residents, they often ask me, well, well, I don't know what to do with the judgment. That, that's probably the most common question in uh, GCAP 63 uh, class uh, on, on um, a cultural response and social justice counseling is, well, what do I do with my judgments? Because I have them. And students tend to feel really guilty when they reflect in their journals. They say, oh my God, I have these judgments. And I often say, well, I would be worried if you didn't have any judgment. And the matter that you have judgment is not a problem. It is what you do with that judgment. Where do you place it? How do you process it? And um, yesterday or the day before, I had a co um, conversation with my... Um, with my friend Randy, who everybody knows who, who she is because I always talk about her, who's an indigenous counselor, counselor here in um, Calgary. And we talked about uh, standing in two worlds and what it means to have judgment but open up space for conversation so that people can heal on both ends and not 
uh, be violent towards each other with words, with action, and so on. And we agreed that the only way to do that is to actually be prepared to sit with another human being and just listen and share what comes up with you for you in a, in a compassionate way. And I'm not quite sure whether I can define compassion in any particular way, but for me, how it feels is being able to sit with a person and say, hey, you know, I know maybe what, what, what you're going through does not maybe fit my worldview, but I get it. I hear you. Um, I see you. You're here in front of me. And the example that I share often with people is uh, an example of a client that I worked with who was mandated to come for counseling. And he came at the end of his uh, peace bond. Um, there was a very slight chance that maybe he will be successful in counseling. So I gave him a little bit of a Western psychoeducation about how abuse is not um, legal in Canada, you can't, you know, hurt another person. And he looked me straight in the eye and he said, well, I get that, but you don't understand me. And I said, well, help me understand what is it that I don't understand. And he said, you know, my family and my father in particular works for my entire life to uh, be able to pay 25 pounds for my wife. And they did that for me, and she completely betrayed us all because she wasn't the wife that is worth 25 pounds. And I remember sitting, like I remember what he was wearing, you know, how he was sitting and telling me the story. And I remember thinking, oh gosh, how many cows am I worth? And I had a bit of a giggle internally, but it really put things in perspective for me in terms of what has happened for him, what his context was. And so suddenly in front of me, there was no perpetrator that was mandated for counseling, but there was a human being with particular life experience, uh, knowledge, um, diversity that I had to understand first to be able to offer him help that he needed. Um, and so I, I have to step back and say, okay, this is unconditional positive regard. To step back, and say, okay, I see you, and I'm not going to judge you based on what brought you here, but I'm going to listen to your story, and, and we're going to move from there. And that's where, I, because I have the judgment that this is yet another person who has hurt another person, is mandated, he has to go to the group, there was like a structure to it. Um, I think there's a difference between just working with people as, as it is described by theory, and then being with an individual and, and their collective culture. Because they bring their cultures with them. He didn't only talk about himself, he talked about his family, his father, his village, his understanding of the world, his wife, and so on. And the story evolved um, in, in a different direction from the one that I think would go in if I just stuck with. That was my big learning. I was a resident at the time, so I was pretty green and pretty westernized, you know, in terms of therapy. But over the years, I've, I've learned that um, if we don't bring ourselves and we are not able to crack open like a nut in front of people and really become vulnerable to listening, um, we're not going to get far in doing psychological work. That's what comes up for me. Yeah, thank you, Ivana. That's what I love about that is that it's all rooted in the stories. You know, it's rooted in your story of who you are as a person, and it's rooted in his story of who he was as a person and how he, like you said, brought his entire world with him when he walked into your office and, mm -hmm. and you made a choice to, to see as opposed to not see that entire world. So I think that really is a great story of bringing to light the kinds of things that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I may talk about this a little later uh, about um, uh, the name that I carry, but um, uh, uh, Randy has given me unofficial name, uh, uh, an indigenous name, and this is when we started working together on her research in, of cultural engagement. 
And she said to me, you know, if I had, um, you know, an ability to name you, I would name you the one who sees with both eyes. And I was thinking, what does that even mean? I felt really proud, didn't know what she meant, but she said, you know, you only have one eye, but there's an eye within you that somehow feels, sees uh, people in a different way. And I thought, oh, wow, what, a, what, a, what an absolute honor that someone thinks about that, uh, who thinks that about me. But at the same time, that I did not come about just like that. I wasn't born with any special, uh, you know, inner eye kind of seeing things. I think it, it's the work that you have to do when you're in this, when you're in the program of becoming a counseling psychologist, but also as a person. This is a person making business, you know, it's, it's very much your own becoming. And many people, when they start um, school uh, to, to become psychologists, I think that's when the real work starts happening. Mm -hmm. It's a great um, fit with what we're talking about in this particular chapter, which is um, bringing ourselves and what it actually means to um, bring our our authentic and vulnerable selves, but in service of the client. Wow. Uh, and, you know, being, yeah. being open to what needs to change in us and how we need to be responsive to the particular person that comes and is before us in this counseling session. Absolutely. And it's not something you can plan, I don't think. I mean, you can plan your session, create an agenda, all that, uh, you know, prescribed things. But when people ask me, what's the most important thing for you in therapy? What, what approach do you practice from? I often say I try to practice from the approach of authenticity. I have to bring myself in and be who I am. You know, I may have a really ridiculous joke or, or something, you know, but if I couldn't bring myself into session, then I would be in a wrong business kind of thing. So for me, this is not a business. I, I say business often, but it's, it's more of a way of life. And I say that to students often. I say, when once you become a counselor, that's not just a job. It's not just a role. It's, it's actually a way of being. Mm -hmm. You think in those terms. You explain the world in those, in those terms. You open up to different experiences in those terms, in terms of helping another person being, healing, um, one other person. So I think that's for me the most important piece, the uh, authenticity, and then everything else comes with it. Mm -hmm. Easier. Thank you for sharing that. Yes.